Crucifer and choristers enter the antechapel, the nave in King's College Chapel here in Cambridge. A college founded by Henry VI, who ordained that in the family of kings, there should always be 16 boys to sing as choristers with the grown men. The Crucifer and choristers, joined now by the choral scholars, full undergraduate members of the college, and members too of one of the great choirs of the world. This year, 180 million people around the world will hear the Christmas Eve carol service from King's College Chapel. But for the young choristers and the college undergraduates who make up the choir, it's a small element in their musical calendar. When Henry VI founded King's College in 1441, uh, he stipulated that there must be this wonderful chapel that he had as a dream almost at the time, and that in this chapel there should be, in perpetuity, uh, services sung almost daily, if not daily, by a choir which would consist of men, lay clerks, and choristers and that the boys who were to be choristers had to be the responsibility of the college in terms of their education. Now that is how the school came about. In 1878 it was set up where we are sitting now as a full school by the college on its own land. We have some 270 to 280 pupils in the school of whom 90 are girls, so it's about a third. All the boarders, some 50 or so, are boys, including the 24 choristers and probationers. <laughs> Underneath everything else, we wear a white shirt with a starch collar, which is um, an Eton regulation collar. It's very stiff, and we usually choose the soft ones because then. And um, after that, we wear a black tie um, to conceal mainly the front stud. And over that, we have the waistcoat, and which, of course, black. Um, and we do up all the buttons but the, the um, bottom one out of tradition because we think um, that, I think the story is that Henry VIII couldn't, uh, couldn't do it up, so we just don't. And uh, uh, we wear sort of striped trousers. I mean, there are lots of different styles we have because we've changed them over the years, so they're, they're slightly different to all of them. And over that we wear jackets. Um, I don't know quite why. It's a sort of mini version of tails without the tails. 
and on top of that, of course, the gown, which is much special. And last of all, we have the sort of all famous top hat, which is, I mean, they're all different. Some of them are ruined half, and so it looks quite old, actually. It's quite funny, actually, because you get some tourists pointing at you. They're normally not French, though, because the French ones usually laugh their heads. Because you get a lot of French students over here at this time. They find it very funny, so we just look at them. And then there are lots of tourists sort of taking pictures. But I think what we find more odd is when we're just in any old clothes, you know, jeans and things, um, nobody looks at you. You just get that funny sensation, because you're so used to people looking at you, then nobody does. Every afternoon, the boys walk the quarter mile from the school to the chapel to sing Evensong. This is the reason for the choir's existence, and it's at the heart of their daily routine. It's quite intense, a lot more intense than the average school life, because whereas most other boarders and day pupils, at the, at the end of school at 4.15, will be able to go home or have free time to work, whereas the choristers, before the end of school, have to go to chapel, and so we don't get the time that they will have to do prep. Doing open services every day um, was almost, in a way, like doing a, a job, I suppose. Um, but all the sort of extra things that happen, like staying on and seeing at Christmas and going on tours and doing recordings and things like that, um, could be great fun. And in some of the tours, you got sort of treated like sort of pop stars. I'm the housemaster, which means I'm responsible for all the boarders. I teach divinity, religious, which is religious studies within the school. Um, I'm also what's called the chorister's tutor, which means I have an umbrella responsibility over the chorister's academic, pastoral, social well-being. I don't think the choristers are very different from the other boarders. They have the same sort of goals. Um, obviously, most of them are moving on um, to senior independent schools when they leave. But they do have certain other realms of experience to offer. Um, there's the whole the self-discipline which they achieve, um, which a lot of other children that simply don't have that degree of self-discipline. They have also the whole question of the spiritual realm, which they encounter, which other children simply would never be in touch with in the same sort of sense. The school really plays a supportive role um, in, and helps to make sense of what they do every day in the chapel. Because, you know, sometimes there isn't time for them to make a lot of sense. Um, when you have to be so busy and committed musically, you can't be thinking through what everything means. It's an unbroken tradition since, I mean, before the Reformation, apart from the time of, of, of Cromwell, and is derived, I think, from the monastic tradition, whereby you had the daily singing of liturgy, the Opus Dei. And St. Augustine, it was, who said, qui cantat bis orat, whoever sings, prays twice. And so that there is this idea that by uh, bringing the liturgy to life in a musical way that you are heightening the experience. It's curious that at a time when society is becoming more secular, that cathedral music, to put it in quotes, is, I reckon, better known than it's ever been before. There are 16 boys and 14 men 
The entire choir is divided into two sides, eight boys on each side, seven men on each side. The two sides are named Cantorus and Decani. Cantorus because it's the cantor, which is the chaplain, and Decani because the dean's on that side. The men are two altos on each side, two tenors on each, on each side, and three basses on each side. The act station is quite often levelled, that it becomes a concert and a showpiece. Stephen tries very hard not to make it a, a performance and to try and make it an act of worship. Um, for instance, he won't conduct from the middle in a service, he will move to the side so that he's not obstructing things and he's not centre stage. Um, I don't think he would want us to be centre stage either, but the music to be the important thing. Um, I know he feels very strongly about that and there are other uh, not all the choral scholars are religious, but quite a few of us are, to some degree at least, six or seven will take communion, a Eucharist generally. And it's important not to let the music become the only thing, because it does become a concert.
one of the stimulating things, I think, for those of us who work here is that this takes place in the midst of an academic community. And so the boys are educated at the college school, the 14 choral scholars and the two organ scholars are doing their studies within this community. And I think this gives it really an integrity that is important. There's a feel, well, there certainly used to be a feeling in the college that a lot of the choral scholars were there simply because they could sing, and in fact they were thickies. Uh, now, this isn't true at all anymore, at least I hope it's not. If you bear in mind that last year King's got the top um, academic results in the university, and the choral scholars as a whole did better on average than the, the, the college as a whole. The absolute amount of time we spend singing in the chapel it isn't, too, isn't too high by itself, say, on average of two hours a day. Um, the main problem is that it's so rigid and fixed. It's between sort of four and six every day. Most games do tend to sort of take place in the afternoon and do, do run on a little, a little right. towards five o'clock. Mm -hmm. I find myself sort of sometimes just, just batting first and then having to run off retired choir, it says in the school book. No one's ever late for rehearsal, ever. There was one incident last year and where it's, it was uh, uh, a chap in the choir, it was no fault of his own, he was stuck out on the river on a boat and, uh, and the race didn't start for hours and hours and he turned up 40 minutes late and uh, Stephen was really quite upset. Have you ever been late? No, I've been on time. <laughs> right, well let's move on to verse 3 now. I think if Michael and Robert would just come to the come and stand out in front of the piano. Amplius lava me. Okay. I think the first part was much better. Let's have a go at the second bit. I think it would help you if you could even take a breath there. Give you a little bit more to work on, wouldn't it? That was a bit flat, the A there, wasn't it? And you've got to have enough breath to be able to sing that a bit stronger, okay? You usually worry about it just before, you know, within five minutes before. But you don't usually worry, um, not even if it's a big solo. Um, you don't usually worry until, you know, literally a couple of minutes before. Because, of course, you, when you're practicing, you can re-practice it and get it right again. But this is your last chance, basically.
there's no particular reason why um, the boy treble should be preferable to a girl treble. Because personally, I've never heard a set of girl trebles who have been had the same kind of training for six years. So it there must be some kind of fascination with the with the image or something. And just maybe there's something to do with the fact that a treble voice is only temporary. Um, his voice is going to change very shortly. It's sort of precious for that reason. And then kind of call really loudly. And even when they were very close, call really loudly. And then got out of the way at the last minute and they bumped into each other. Now then, just hang back. Don't sit on the seats because we don't know where we're going to be yet. Uh, no, no, don't go there, please. Come over this way. Do you want your game of Monopoly? I hope to be in the choir at my next school. But obviously it's not quite the same sort of thing as here. But I don't think I'll, I'll be in the choir um, when I first go. Um, because perhaps my voice might break quite soon. And it's unwise to um, sing while your voice is going through the change from treble to bass or tenor. I suppose there's no point worrying about it because it's quite inevitable. In a way, I suppose, a bit like death. You know it's going to happen. I left the choir at Easter because my voice was going. It was OK before the Easter holidays. And I was actually ill over Easter. And I came back on Easter Sunday and I couldn't sing very well. And I just couldn't really sing. What did it feel like? Strange, really. Annoying sometimes. Because you're trying, but it didn't come. Personally, I don't particularly want it to break because um, I like singing trebles. I mean, it's nice and sort of on top, basically. So I, I'm. I'd personally rather it to be a long way away from there, so I'd, I'd like to be able to sing in my next school's choir. Yeah. Do you have any inkling at all of when it might happen? None at all, no. It could be any time. Or about what kind of voice you might have afterwards? Um, no, I don't. Some people do. Some people, um, the person who comes and teaches us um, how to sing. Um, he sometimes can tell some people definitely what they're going to be. Like, um, I think he thought Robert would be a tenor. And I think that's... I don't know what I'm going to be. I remember one time I was listening to a tape with my father, and they're the really nice high floating top B flats, really high notes, and uh, it was a recording I'd done as a treble. And I just started crying, because you know it's never going to be as easy as that. It's always going to be hard work from now on, in a way that the voice production, in, at, at least, wasn't when I was a treble. And that's a loss, and you've got to come to terms with that. And uh, I wonder how much some of the younger ones realise that now. As the choir assembles for the end-of-term photo, the choristers face a time of uncertainty. For the choral scholars, that's in the past. They face the hard work of training their adult voices. There is a tradition of men singing high in Europe in the form of castrati who sang in Europe a few centuries ago, and particularly in Italy. Um, of course, the similarities between us and them stop very soon. Um, but therefore, there was a tradition, and we don't know whether the countertenors in our form um, took off because of the disappearance of castrati or, or what. We, don't, we actually don't know. Let's just take this from the bottom of two, could we please? The interesting thing about the alto or the countertenor in the English cathedral choirs is that this again is an unbroken tradition. Even though the countertenor was not heard in the concert hall, many years. Nevertheless, they went on being in cathedral choirs. 
What we do know is that in the 19th century, it seemed to go out of fashion, whatever tradition there was, and we don't hear anything about them until this century, where there's a chap called Alfred Della, um, who was very popular um, and took the world by storm with this new sound, which had been totally forgotten. Beautiful sound, you've got super breath control as well. And I think that's encouraged a lot of people um, to, to take up the voice, and now it's very popular. The acoustics of the chapel do obviously affect the sound of any music made in there. There's about a six second echo. If you go in with nobody there at a very quiet time of the day and fire a revolver shot, you get about six seconds. If you make a good sound, then I think the building enhances that and builds that up. At the same time, if you make a sound of not good quality simply because the echo is amplifying in this and making it go on for a long time then uh, in that sense the building is being critical I suppose I first started thinking about the acoustic of King's College Chapel when I was a student, because I was a student in King's, not obviously in the choir, but I did spend a certain amount of time sitting in the chapel listening. And um, my memory of that is, firstly, of the tallness of the chapel. It's so high uh, compared to the length of the bit you sit in. And this already gives me an impression of the sound as, as having a very great height and particularly a brightness, which I think also comes from the particular way that the light comes through the beautiful stained glass. And the fact that the stone is, seems to me almost white, very bright anyway. So when I came to write this piece, Illuminare Jerusalem, I think that was the first impression I had of a very bright, high tone from the boys. And I decided to make that really the main feature of the piece and to do that by offsetting it with very deep sounds, very low sounds for the basses and very, very low sounds from the organ, which are really so low that you don't perceive them as notes, more as just a wobble in the ear. Of course, when you write a piece for particular circumstances, you run the risk of those circumstances not being there in different performances. I would say in any kind of cathedral acoustic, there's going to be quite a bit of resonance and probably quite a lot of height. The last concert of the summer term was in Norwich Cathedral. The choir sang works written specially for kings, including several commissioned by Stephen Clearbury from contemporary composers like John Taverner, Arvo Pert and Judith Weir. Well, she's different to most other composers. Um, not that I don't like it, I do actually quite like the two pieces that she's written for Kings, but they're plain odd. I mean, they're very discordant, 
but they're interesting to sing and they're uh, quite good fun. I certainly don't want to go because, well, I've been here a nice long time and I sort of just got used to it, so I don't want to go at all. I'm going to, I'm going to miss the school a lot. I spent a lot of time in the choir. I'm going to miss them the most. Well, I will be sad not to be a Trevor anymore. I'd love to come back and be a choral scholar here, but I don't know, I have to wait and see what happens.
by choosing boys for a choir with a particular quality of voice, of reasonable academic standard, with good stamina and a sparkle to them, we are indeed picking some very special children. I don't deny that a charge of elitism can be leveled at the school, but then if you really think about it, anybody who is really good at something is a member of an elite. And I must stress that all choristers from whatever background receive a very generous scholarship from the college of two-thirds of the fees. And if the parents cannot afford the difference, we do our utmost to bridge the gap. Hi, I'm Magnus. Thomas is, um... Hello. I'm Captain. Captain. Okay, sure. Right, so he's on the top bunk. Yeah. Apart from the choral side, the instrumental music in the school plays a very large part. We have two large orchestras of over 70 players. We have three choirs in addition. There are something like 180 instrumentalists out of 220 plus pupils learning one, two or three instruments. There are music lessons going on all week, all day. There are about 24 music teachers, visiting ones, peripatetic music teachers. There's a considerable amount of music activity. Well, what, what happens is we get up in the morning, wash, and then we go down for breakfast. And then after that, we have music practice, and I have to play my um, piano first practice and cello second practice, and there are bells in the middle to tell you when to go to your next practice. And then after that, um, it's chorus to practice, and then um, we just sing. After that, we um, start lessons. We might have French, English, Latin. And after those lessons, we have lunch. And then we have two more periods. And then um, we have games. But um, like on Tuesdays, choristers can only go, and go to half an hour of the games period because we have chapel. Well, um, I'm 10 years old, and I've just become a chorister. Um, since the beginning of Easter, I've been coming down to chapel with the choristers as what's called a senior probationer. Um, you're called a probationer when you come. You arrive first at this school, but you're not actually a chorister, but you're going to be. Um, and then when you become a senior probationer, you start just going down to chapel with the choristers. Um, and like being as a reserve in case one of them's ill. But I was quite lucky in my case because um, poor Ben Dawson was, um, he had a sore th throat for quite a while. He had something wrong with him. So I got to sing a lot of the services. At the end of this term, it's nine lessons and carols. Um, Is that fun? Yeah. yeah it's 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 what happened? Well, what we have to prepare um, uh, about four weeks before three weeks. And we sort of do um, little bits out of the um, mm. hundred, hundred carols for class. Yeah. The students Ferris, like Ferris carols. Things all merry and high. And I'm quite looking forward to it because it'll be my first Christmas. Yeah. So I wasn't here last year. Right. Ding dong merrily then, number 18B. We'll take this up a semitone in B. Okay. And two. And. <laughs> I think the sound of a choir inevitably changes over the years because it has a different membership and because it inevitably reflects the personality 
and ideas of different directors. So if you were to ask me whether I had deliberately changed it, I think the answer would be no. But if you were to say, has it changed, I think the answer would be yes. And if you said, how had I done that, I would say, by trying to encourage the choir to sing with a bright, forward tone, and even when singing in English, to try to use the bright colours of Italian wherever possible. Okay, now there's a few points that you usually just need looking at in this piece. First of all, in the second bar, we want to make sure that's not flat. Ding dong, merrily on heart. What bar are you going to sing on that note? Oh. Ah, nice. Hi, in case it's got plenty of colour. Then we, one or two of you a bit sluggish off that uh, dotted minute. Da, 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 dim, 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 dim. Okay, then on ringing, the second note you phrased away very nicely, but it's got to have a length. Ringing, ring, it's got to have a vowel on it. Okay, then the same points would apply to the second phrase with sky, nice R vowel. Now on Gloria, we must make sure that the sound, particularly on the higher notes, is, is well forward. La. If you start getting your lips across in the wrong place, it won't sound very good. Okay, and... Okay, now, we, the G and the L are a bit of a nuisance in this context. La, la. We don't want them to spoil that note, do we? So we just sing to law this time. One, two. So that's what we get after Hosanna in excelsis. Yeah. that nice and soft sound. Okay, Hosanna. One and two. Hosanna in excelsis. One of the things I'm really looking forward to about this Christmas. Um, is I've walked down to chapel in the spring and the summer and the autumn, but I've never actually been down in the winter. This year, I hope it's going to be a snowy Christmas. So when we're walking down to chapel, it'll be snowing and we'll be able to play with our sledges and everything. The Christmas Eve service of Nine Lessons and Carols began in 1918, and the choir has achieved an international reputation through broadcasts on radio and television. This places a heavy responsibility on the chorister chosen to sing the traditional solo verse that opens once in Royal David City. Last year, it was Michael Pierce. 